really appreciate the uh, day we had yesterday. I learned a lot, and uh, I feel like uh, everybody had a positive experience, and hopefully you had a good night's rest and ready for today. And uh, we've got a lot of things we need to cover today. And, uh, and I challenged you yesterday to get prepared for the think tank. So I know all of you have been thinking about that a lot and got some input that you want to accomplish with uh, spending, kind of giving us some ideas, some things that you've learned. You know, uh, I just was thinking about some of the experiences that I've had that I thought I might share, and uh, maybe, maybe that will uh, inspire some creative thinking on your part. But I remember when uh, in Heather's uh, presentation, first thing yesterday morning, she mentioned uh, Steve Albee. And Steve Albee with EPA uh, was, a, was a, a very important uh, teacher, mentor for me when I was started working with the city of Atlanta. And I was very impressed with his story that he was the one that actually in the mid-90s that authored the uh, gap analysis that was done by EPA. I don't know, but I think that was probably the first time that an organization, there have been several since then, that really stopped to look at what the uh, needs are, uh, financial needs are in this country to meet the, to meet the requirements uh, for the water industry, water, wastewater, storm water. And uh, I remember him telling me that that really opened his eyes to the fact that we've got to do something different because we had seen Public Law 92500 come into play in 1972, and we saw, you know, the, the uh, funding that went behind what they call the construction grant program during the early days of that uh, implementation of that law and, uh, the, and the impact that it had on uh, utilities because it required, of course, the meeting the NPDES permits, but also required utilities before they got funding for the treatment plants to make sure that they've taken a look at their sewer lines through the SSES program. And actually, uh, what was a big program during that period was doing what, what was called the 201 facility plans. The 201 was a section of the regulations, and it re had a very organized way that, uh, that uh, consultants in cities had to go in and, and, uh, and evaluate their sewer lines and, and identify defects, structural, and also infiltration. And uh, during that time, I had moved into a position of vice president of engineering for a consulting company down in Alabama, and about 80% of our business was uh, based on doing those 201 facility plans. So I made a lot of presentations to utilities and cities and getting the, getting the contracts, and then we did everything, everything that was required as far as the dye water flooding and the flow monitoring and the flow isolation and smoke testing, all that. We did all that in-house except for the CCTV. And then four of us in the company, three vice presidents and a president, formed a company called Quadruplex in the late 70s and bought the CCTV equipment. So it was involved heavily in, in that program. There was a lot of funding that came in, but then uh, it ended, and it, it, the funding ended. The, lo the requirements didn't. But, you know, it was kind of, think I think the, the thinking was, well, we, we, we've got this momentum going with these cities, and certainly they... They understand the importance of being able to continue to try to identify sources of infiltration and condition of their pipelines and the impact that that would have on their treatment plants and future, future investments. But it seemed like it kind of tab tabled for a while and maybe even slowed down to the point that uh, we started seeing, I've, I've heard, reverse, uh, reverse impacts as far as the pollution, contamination of our, of our waterways. And that kind of led us into the next phase, and that had to do with uh, the consent decrees. Then we started seeing, seeing uh, environmental groups uh, supported by EPA that really drove the consent decree programs, and uh, they started getting larger and larger. And the first thing we knew, we had some that were over a billion dollars, and then the next thing we knew, we had Atlanta with over a $4 billion budget to meet the consent decree, so it just seemed like that was growing and, 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 and from the standpoint of that it took the, you know, the federal government and, uh, and uh, the consent decrees and commission orders and things like that to, to start moving things forward as far as meeting the requirements of the uh, Clean Water Act. But I think Steve was, uh, had, a, was, had a, a lot of foresight into the fact that 
after he did that gap analysis and saw the magnitude of the investment that was going to be needed to meet the res those requirements, I remember him saying to me, he says, you know, there's no way that we can wait for the federal government to come in with, a, with all the funding that's, that, that's needed to meet those things. He said, we've got to do something different. And so he, he traveled to various countries and uh, saw what they were doing. And then, uh, and, and he was very impressed with what he saw in New Zealand and Australia and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the approach that they were taking. And he came back and I remember putting together the uh, Tom's Bad Day. I, I never did ask him where that Tom came from, but, uh, but, it, but anyway, that was the, the program that Heather talked about. And I had an opportunity when I started with the city of Atlanta to bring Steve and, and a couple of people in to Atlanta twice because first time was to talk with the senior management, uh, with the uh, senior management team within the Department of Watershed Management. And then we brought them in for a bigger program with a lot of the middle uh, supervisors, middle level, level managers, and that had a tremendous impact because of the way that he explained the importance of uh, asset management. So that, uh, I had, a, you know, was very fortunate, I think, to visit him in Washington, D.C. a couple of times and to be in his programs and to be, and to have him actually come to Atlanta and do some training. But I remember him making the comment <coughs> and, and to start out, and he's talking to the municipal people <coughs> and, talk, <coughs> and talk about the fundamentals. He would say, look, if you don't know what you got and you don't know where it is and you don't know what kind of condition it is, he says, you're not managing anything. So he's talking to managers in, in Atlanta. He said, you're not managing anything. He said, you're just waiting for the next crisis to happen so that you can react to it. And I, and, and I said, wow, you know, that's a pretty strong statement, particularly coming from EPA to the, you know, to the municipalities. But in the, in the next uh, 20 years or so, I've seen that uh, become so much, you know, so, so much truth in that. As we move it into the City of Atlanta program, See, Atlanta had their system broken up into six groups, and so they started really focusing in on the field work, uh, the SSES program with uh, Group 1, and each one of those groups had something in the neighborhood of about 300 miles in it. And, uh, and so that first group, I remember them saying uh, they found about 1,000 more manholes than what they thought they had and about 10% more pipeline than they thought they had. So it, re it reminded me back to what Steve said. You know, if you don't know what you got and you don't know where it is, don't know what kind of condition it's in, then, uh, you know, it's very hard to manage anything. So that was uh, kind of interesting because I had spent a lot of time with uh, the people that's in the engineering uh, information systems department of the Department of Watershed Management. Those are the people that took those old hand-drawn drawings, the paper drawings, and put them into CAD and now into GIS and uh, the uh, department, the, the, the head of that department, I was a real good friend of mine, and he was so proud of them. They looked so pretty, and I uh, color coded and all of that, and they were, you know, populating them, pop populating them with the, uh, with the attributes and so forth. And he was very pr proud of that. But I spent most of my time. I think uh, what resonated with me yesterday with George Hawkins is, is, is him work, his, him spending his time directly in the trucks and and working with a with a field crew. I spent most of my time with the operation and maintenance people. And, uh, and the reason I did that is because the consent decree program already had a program management team in place. So it very little, could have very little influence and impact on that, but I, I felt like there was a real need to, to, to make sure that the employees of the city understood what was going on. Because when Jack Ravan became the uh, commissioner, and he came in with a tremendous uh, background on uh, on working with large organizations. As a matter of fact, he was a Region 4 administrator twice. He was, a pre he was the first one to take over that responsibility, appointed by the president. Then, he, then they pulled him into Washington, D.C., so he was over the whole country, and he was the one that actually hired uh, Steve Albee uh, to come into EPA. So he had a tremendous background, and that's why Mayor Franklin appointed him as the commissioner after doing a, in a national search. But uh, one of the things that uh, was remarkable about him is not only was he experienced in working with large organizations, but he was very people-oriented, much like what we saw uh, George being, really working, working with the people. And, and really, when you think about asset management, the things that we're trying to accomplish, it is all people-focused. You know, we've got to be focused on the people. We can't change 
things unless we can help and uh, help the uh, people grow. But uh, I spent a lot, of, a lot of time with the people, and when I talked to them about how they approached the field work and dealt with the things that they had to deal with, they pulled out the old drawings, the old hand drawings. I said, well, why don't you use those nice, pretty uh, drawings that Keith has over there in the EIS? And they said, well, we know they're not accurate. And I said, well, maybe that's true. I don't know. But when they actually went out in the field with those nice, pretty drawings and tried to document everything through the SSES program, and they found out that they weren't accurate either. So it, it really drives home the, uh, the point that, you know, we start out sometimes thinking that the utilities, public or private, really are on top of what they've got and, and, uh, and where it is and what kind of condition it's in. But uh, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're, we often find that that's not true. So when we started uh, the BAMI, and then we got the EPA grant. Actually, Steve Albee was the uh, principal investigator uh, for the grant that BAMI got, and that's uh, explained in there. I hope you take time to really read through the uh, journal because it talks a lot about some of the early days in the, in the history. But uh, when we, so when we started BAMI, and you know, it, it really got formed a no nonprofit organization in 2004 after we had spent almost two years getting things, uh, getting, getting. Uh, working with it within the city. Then we got the grant in 2006, and uh, Steve Albee was the uh, principal investigator for that grant for the government, and I was the principal investigator for it for the, uh, you know, for BAMI. But uh, after we did that, and, and, and the idea behind that grant was we brought in four entities. One was Virginia Tech, Louisiana Tech, Ver uh, University of Texas in Arlington, and the Georgia Rural Water Association. So when I put that team together, uh, I purposely wanted to bring in an organization that represented owners. And their responsibility was, as a subcontractor, uh, to, to, to provide oversight, to make sure this wasn't just an academic exercise that we did, that we really were doing things that could benefit and make us understand the challenges that the utilities were facing. So we had a close working relationship with the Georgia Rural Water Association, and and, uh, and uh, they provided a, a, ver a very good service. But each one of those academic uh, partners, uh, subcontractors, they had a specific deliverable that they had to provide. Louisiana Tech, through the Trenches Technology Center, uh, already had put in place what they called municipal forms, where they would go to different regions around the country, and, and these were put on, they were called municipal forms because they, uh, they were held, they were conducted by a municipality in a region, and then they, they reached out and, uh, to other municipalities. So as part of that program, for over a year, they went face to face with a lot of utilities around the country to find out, you know, do, do they know anything about asset management? You know, this is now in the uh, uh, mid uh, to, with to, to 2000. Uh, we started in 2006, so between 2006 and 2008 time frame. So a lot of them had no idea. And those that did had uh, misconceptions as about what it is as far as uh, asset management. Some would say, well, we have an asset management program because we just invested in a CCTV truck, so we're collecting data. But anyway, uh, what, we, what came out of that was a report from the Trenches Technology Center that really stated really good uh, data that they had that said, you know, what's really needed is more information. There needs to be more awareness. There needs to be education. There needs to be training. But not so much at the, uh, you know, the field work. It really needs to be at the uh, higher level, decision makers and, uh, and managers. They really needed to understand it. it needed to be uh, so that it could try to find champions within the utilities that could really understand and, and get a, get a, develop the, uh, you know, the imagination about what can happen with a good uh, comprehensive risk-based asset management program. So when we finished up that program with EPA and we turned in the report, I say everybody was happy. Uh, we got everybody paid, and, uh, except I was not very happy because I, I knew, I had just knew that there, there, we needed to take it further, not just do a report and move on to another project. So I was able to take the people at at that time, I was head of the construction program at, at Purdue's campus in Indianapolis, so I took professors, uh, a couple of professors and staff and students, and 
we decided we'd put together that first, uh, or put together a online course that could really kind of explain some of the basics, some of the basic principles that we learned in this, uh, through this research work. And so we just, uh, we, we put that together, not knowing whether anybody at all would be interested in taking it. But we just, uh, we ad advertised it. We had an agreement with Benjamin Media, who did the uh, Trenches Technology Magazine. And so they did the promotion. I uh, had a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a staff person at, uh, at IUPUI that managed the program and, and Bammy owned the program. But anyway, it's kind of interesting to see what happened after that. So once we started advertising that there's an online course that people could take uh, uh, that covered the introduction and fundamentals of asset, of asset management, people started taking it. And we started getting feedback. And that feedback was we learned a lot and uh, really interested in learning more, but we really need to know how to develop a plan. How do we, do, how do we develop a plan? What's in the plan? What does it look like? Because we didn't really cover that in the introduction. We just talked about you know, levels of service and benchmarking and some of the things that's principal components of asset management. So then we set out to uh, develop another course, and that became the 200 course. They're all explained in the magazine. And it, it, it was, uh, you know, uh, how to develop a plan, how to develop an asset management plan. And uh, so, you know, when I got into that and took on that responsibility, I said, wow, you know, I need to learn myself. So I had an opportunity. I got a call. Uh, one of the individuals that started calling me about uh, asset management and developing a plan during the time I was trying to think about how to de develop this course uh, was uh, Kurt Wright. He was actually on the video. You couldn't hear him very well yesterday at lunchtime, but he's a consultant in North Carolina. And he is in the mountains of North Carolina, and he kept calling me and asking questions. So I finally met with him. And I said, what's, what's going on? He says, well, I have this uh, town in North Carolina that's Spindale, and it's up in the mountains, and it's a, it used to be a textile, but all the textile mills moved out, and so they've got a sewer system that's really in bad condition. Their treatment plant is oversized, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's flooded with uh, infiltration inflow. And so he said, so I put in a project. I put in a proposal to get a project to replace a 12-inch line that goes through that town that had a lot of... Uh, infiltration associated with it, but it got turned down from the, from the state funding agency, from the Department of, Water Infra uh, uh, Department of Water Infrastructure. And he said he called them and said, what can I do to get this, uh, this, uh, this project funded? Because it's, you know, the, the, the town's going to go broke you know, if they don't do something. And they said, well, you know, you came very close. They have a threshold as far as the points in their algorithm. And they said, if, if you would agree to, to develop an asset management plan, this is the state talking to the consultant in about 2012. He said, if you would agree to uh, develop an asset management plan, then uh, you'll get 10 points. And 10 points was more than any other item that was used in that algorithm. So she said, yeah, I, I, you know, so they turned in another proposal. He got it funded, but he didn't know how to develop a plan. Very experienced engineer, worked with large companies, but now he's uh, uh, kind of a so uh, kind of a, a one-man shop. So he started c taking the course and started learning and started having a lot of questions. So I said, "I tell you what, Kurt, I'll make a deal with you. You know, you're you're developing this plan, and uh, and I'm trying to learn, and so let's work together. You help me develop the course, and I help you do the do the uh, develop the asset management plan, and we'll both." learn and benefit. So, so I did. I spent a lot of time with them. I went to, so we, so we, so we had to talk to the people in the city, in the town, about what's going to happen because we got this grant to do this plan. So I went with them and we pulled in the people, first meeting, uh, we pulled in the people from the director of finance, city engineer, public works director, the person that's over the sewer, the treatment plant, and the person over the collection system. We brought them all in to City Hall, Town Hall. You know what we talked about? Core values. Of course, we told them about the, about the uh, thing, but we told, we told them, you know, to really get started here, we, don't need, we need everybody to get on the same page, and we need to really get together and work together as a team to make this thing work. Because it's not just putting together a report that we can satisfy something with the state and get some money. 
but it's really a program that we're interested in implementing here. And so it was very interesting, that conversation. We went through an exercise with them on how to select and determine core values and get a consensus with those different groups. When we asked the finance manager what is her primary mission or, you know, the thing that, that she's focused on, she said, I need to make sure the bills are paid. The guy to get the treatment plan, I need to make sure the, we meet the NPDES permits. Over the collection system, I need to make sure we don't have any SSOs. But we all got them all together, and they did come up with a list of uh, core values that they all agreed, the priorities. Next week, Kurt and I went to the town council, believe it or not, an hour before their town council meeting, they all got together and we talked to them about what this, what this asset management plan was all about. And they went through the same exercise, and they came up with the core values, and then we got them to come to merge together. But long story short, so we got started not by telling me we got a lot of problems and, uh, you know, we've got, got to get data and we've got to fix pipe and all that. We talked to them about the program and how to get the program off. So when I talked to the public works director, the guy that's over, over the, over the, over the uh, system, I asked him, I said, how many miles of pipe do you have in this town? He said, well, we got 33. And he said that with all the confidence in the world. I said, well, how do you know you got 33 miles of pipe? He said, well, we've got this nice GIS map up on the wall here, and that's what it tells us. It tells us we got 33 miles of pipe. And he said, and we feel like it's accurate because that's the second engineering company that we hired to develop that map. The first one, we got it. It looked pretty, but there were so much disconnections and so much errors in it, we threw it away and hired another consultant. So we spent a lot of money to get this accurate one. But actually, when we started doing the field work with that small town, we found out, and we went to every manhole that we could find, and uh, and opened it up and inspected it and, and uh, developed the connectivity. They had 61 miles of pipe, 61 miles of pipe, not 33. The uh, finance director was very happy. She says, wow, we got more assets than we thought we had. That's going to look good. The guy over the collection system said, no, that's not good. He said, we, we're on a, uh, under a uh, commissioner's order to inspect 10% of our pipe every year. And he said, we can't even afford the 3.3 miles, much less the 6.1 miles. So it just, again, drove home the, uh, the principle to me that, you know, we, we, that, that the fundamentals, that go back to what Steve said, if you don't know what you got and where it is and what kind of condition it is, you're not managing anything, we can't take for granted that uh, the utilities that, that, that we work with really have that accurate and complete information. So that's uh, a big part of making sure we get off to the, to the, the right foot on, uh, on things. So, uh, you know, just uh, it's kind, of, kind of an interesting point that I, I emphasize because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I struggle with trying to figure out how can we get the utilities to really understand the importance of what we're talking about here in this, uh, you know, in, in this Congress. Why is it, why is it gonna take the uh, state agencies and the, and the, and the laws of, a, of states to force utilities to develop asset management plans? Some, are not, like in Indiana, they're not gonna be able to get funding uh, unless they have an approved asset management plan. But the, but the guidelines for asset management plans in Indiana came out in 2019. And a lot of, lo, lo, a lot of uh, promotion went out to the utilities about the importance of uh, asset management. But no action was really taken. So what, what do we need to do? There's about 2,000 utilities in, uh, in Indiana. And according to Steve Albee, I think these numbers are probably still accurate. There's about 70,000 utilities, water and sewer across the country. There's a, in America, it's kind of different from a lot of other countries that have a few utilities or one governing, governing agency. But in, in, uh, in America, a lot of fragmentation. About 93% of those, we're told, are served communities less than 10,000. And that's where a real need is. 
a lot of the larger ones, uh, they are blessed with having more resources and, and uh, financial and, 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 uh, and talent uh, to deal with a lot of these things, but uh, some of the smaller ones uh, struggle. So when that law was passed in Indiana, and that law, by the way, is uh, Senate Bill 272, if you wanted to Google it, but it was uh, very impressive. Uh, it was signed by the governor on March the 7th, 2022, so it's fairly new. It required the utilities to have an asset, an approved asset management plan before uh, July 1, 1 of this year. So it's in, it's in play right now. And uh, the thing, one of the things that it also authorized was the establishment of a statewide database for water. It also authorized the establishment of a water asset management center. The, the center that wrote it had picked out, had, uh, had uh, identified Purdue as the place for that water center to be established. And so, you know, we got excited about it. I got excited about it. We got excited about it, the other members of our team, and we had meetings with, uh, with the Indiana Finance Authority, which is the authority, the agency in Indiana that's under the law that was passed is responsible for compliance. So we had meetings with them. We actually had, uh, we actually testified before the Senate Utility Committee in, in, in uh, Indianapolis on uh, what, we're, what we want to see that center do. We got a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest at the beginning, but then something happened. And the Indiana Finance Authority, the people that we were meeting with, uh, had, had some organizational change, but basically it seemed like they weren't as excited about the center as they were when that law was first passed. And uh, we began to realize that uh, a lot of the focus for IFA had changed as a result of, uh, of mandates from the government. And the mandate had to do a lot with, uh, it had primarily with the lead service line mandates that have to be met by October 16th, I think, of next year. So IFA uh, realized that that's not an option. They've got to help the, uh, they've got to comply with that law. So uh, one of the things that, that, that I did, uh, we did as a result of trying to get prepared for uh, putting that center in place is uh, at Purdue I put together a, util a uh, underground infrastructure team, Way and the students here. And so we went down and had, uh, we, we, we started, uh, we had meeting, we, we had put on some workshops with the Alliance uh, Rural Water Association and through that got to know Adam Hirschberger, and at that time he was with a company called uh, Utility. And, uh, and so I, after we had done the workshop, uh, we, we met and said, you know, what, what can we do to, to start moving things forward in Indiana to, uh, to help comply with, help utilities comply with that law? They were already under, uh, Ziptility was already under contract to do the data management and GIS work for a small town called Ziptility. And that's explained in the in the magazine, little little blurb in the magazine on that. I said to Adam, I said, you know, and, and he told me that there's another company that's under contract to this uh, town of, of about 300 people, maybe a little bit less than 300 people, very small, but they had their own water system and their own sewer system. I said, well, maybe working through BAMI, we can agree to work together on a volunteer basis to develop a, a, a plan for this town that we could eventually use as a model for other towns because they had contracts with about 40 other small utilities and we thought maybe if we can come up with a, a model we can we can do it. So we started working with this with this town and uh, and so we're still working with them. We've had uh, four meetings with the town council to uh, help them understand what the plan is all about but they're very, very eager to work with us. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're in the, still in the process of doing that. And again, we'll keep you posted through the magazine on, uh, on the journal of what's happening. But uh, I'm rambling a little bit. I'm gonna have to stop here. <laughs> but I wanted to get back to the North Carolina case. After we did that, put the plan together, sent it to the state. The view reviewer in Raleigh with a state agency called, called Kurt and said, Kurt, how did you do this? You get an A plus. We've never seen such a excellent plan come in. And 
it wasn't because I had anything to do with it, but it, he just did a very detailed, thorough study. And the thing that really got their attention is he did the 20-year projection on the plan. That's the, that's the real challenging part of putting one of these plans together. It's not just trying to identify where the problems are, but it's looking into the future. So he had done a uh, projection for the next 20 years, three scenarios. One is if they don't do anything, keep the rates the same, what is it going to look like in 20 years as far as the condition of the, of the lines? What is it going to look like if they keep the rates just enough to keep the status quo as far as the deterioration and condition of the sewer lines? What is that going to look like? What, 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 what will the rates need, need to be? The third scenario is what does it really need to be? What's the right rate to make sure that they not only keep the condition of their pipe as it is, which is already below standard, because that's the reason that they're, they're under that consent to uh, their commissioner's order, and it's also why they have so much infiltration. So what do they need to do to improve the condition of their, of their uh, infrastructure? And also have a sinking fund, so at the end of the period they have some money just for the rainy day type thing. And so that rate was established, it was presented to the town council, and guess what happened? That town council voted unanimously to go with scenario three. They voted unanimously to increase the rates over the next five years to be on that projectile to have, have a, have a uh, system in place that's going to be better than it is today. And what that taught me is the importance of communication. We didn't start out telling them how bad their system was. We told them they need to come together with some core values and mission and objectives. And then we kept them informed along the way, put the report together, and they had to vote on it. And they voted unanimously. A few months after that, there was an article that came out in the paper, a local paper. And there was a quote in there by one of the council members, a lady that had been on the council for years. And she was upset because the garbage pickup rate was going to have to increase the trash. That's what the article was about. Why are we having to increase the rates on garbage pickup? And in that article, she says, now I understand why we had to increase the rates on the sewer because of condition. That rang a bell. That said, good communications with the, with the decision makers is what's important in making sure that we can have good asset management programs. So what happened with the state uh, in Raleigh is after they got that report, uh, of course, I had been working with Kurt, and they, said, they asked if we could come and teach. By that time, we had completed the four courses that's explained in your journal. And they said, would you come to Raleigh and teach our, this is the, the rector of the Department of Water and Infrastructure, will you come to Raleigh and teach our personnel, our, our reviewers, they had 13 reviewers of, of different plans and asset management plans was part of it and uh, so that they can all be on the same page at the same time and we can work together. So we did that. That was the first time that we did a four-day course in one day each, one day for each course. And I was amazed because we did it. We had them, we had them comply with the same requirements as if they took it online. And there's people from 16 countries that's taken it online, so it's been very well accepted. But we, did, we wanted to make sure that the people that took it in the classroom did the same thing. What that meant was that after every chapter, they had to take a test. Now, these are professional. These are state, you know, thir 13 out of the, I think it was 29 people there going through this course in Raleigh, 2015. Uh, we had, uh, you know, they're all professional people from cities and consulting companies. Like I say, 13 people from the city. But can you imagine four days after every chapter stopping taking a test, and then we had graders. We had our people there, the grade, and, uh, and they did that. I thought I might get a rebellion. You know? <laughs> people say, we've never been to a program that requires that. What I, what I learned is, is that they weren't out playing on the phone or you know, texting or anything. They were listening because they knew they was going to have a test. So we learned, learned a lot. So we've done those uh, courses now, cl uh, classroom courses on demand uh, four times, and we've got the fifth one coming up in Cincinnati. But we're learning, learning a lot. But still, what, are we, what is it going to take to really reach the utilities across the country about asset management? What is it going to take? Well, I'd 
that's what we're going to open up the think tank thinking about. Adam Hershberg, he and I have uh, become uh, colleagues. He's now with the Alliance of uh, Indiana Rural Water. That's part of the National Rural Water Association. Way and I have had an opportunity to work with him and, and the and Alliance on putting on some workshops. The one we did, one we did in, uh, they have one in Prince Lick every year and one in Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne's coming up in October if anybody's interested in going to that. Very excellent uh, program of conferences. The first one we participated in, we had a two hour workshop and uh, that was in French Lick a couple of years ago. Actually, it was right after that law was passed. And Way and I put on a program. We had one of our uh, visiting scholars. He was here yesterday. He's not here now, but he's from South Korea. And he came to us as a visiting scholar from the water and wastewater lab at the University of Seoul and done a lot of research work on projecting and, and, uh, and uh, forecasting water main breaks. So he did a, did a session. Then we had, uh, we had George Kurz come in. If you don't know George, well, if you, know, if, if you read anything about infiltration inflow, you probably know that name, George Kurz, because he's just spent his career uh, focusing on the impacts of uh, infiltration inflow. And he did, he's done a study like the whole state of uh, Tennessee, I think North Carolina too, where he's looked at the impact of uh, infiltration across the state and what if they could remove 50%, what kind of, what would it cost and what would be the cost benefit? So I had him come in and do a, do a session as part of our two hour workshop. And, uh, and that, was, that was great. George is uh, very knowledgeable on Switch City. When we started working in Switch City, we had him do an analysis of the infiltration inflow just based off the records from the treatment plant. And uh, can, he, he, he cost it out as costing the town about $10,000 a year doesn't sound like maybe a whole lot if you're if you're Chicago or someplace, but for a little old town with less than 300 people, ten thousand dollars a year is a lot of money. But he, he he you know he was able to provide a lot of value on that, so we were able to utilize some of the resources that we we had to help us. But I asked uh, Adam this morning if uh, if maybe he would say a few words as we move into our uh, think tank. I'm already into it. Maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about, he, he's moved from Ziptility to now uh, uh, in Alliance of Rural Water, maybe some of the things that they are seeing. You know, rural, uh, rural, every state has a, 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 a rural water organization and, and some have maybe two, and all of them part of the National Rural Water Association. So. Is the mic on? There we go. Yeah, go ahead. Test, test. Well, first of all, thank you, Tom. And Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I, I appreciate all the work you guys put into pulling this together. Um, and thanks to all the presenters and contributors yesterday. Um, yeah, you did a great job, I think, of, of um, summarizing our, our work together so far. Um, I'll just add a little bit of detail. Um, so I am with the Alliance of Indiana Rural Water. Um, I support predominantly that 90 or 93 percent of the state utilities Tom mentioned that are sub 10,000 population. You know, and just to put a little context on that, in in contrast to some of the larger uh, utility perspectives we've heard from, I had a, a gentleman come up to me at a training in Indiana, rural Indiana, and he said he said that inventory part, you know, that we just covered was really interesting. But you know, he said I don't have much of an inventory. I've got a I've got a pump, a chlorinator, and a prayer. And, and uh, so that gives you kind of an idea of, of where, where he's at and sort of that cultural change that we're working to uh, the people side of, of this work that's, you know, more art maybe than science. But um, anyway, so I'm, I'm working with these small rurals and um, they historically haven't applied much to SRF. They haven't leaned that way for funding uh, for what they've explained to me, various reasons. They've gone rural development and other routes. Uh, but now, um, all of a sudden they are interested because they want to access these BIL funds for lead service line inventory, uh, for PFAS, PFOS, uh, potential um, testing and, and potential infrastructure implications there. So they're very interested in what this will take to, to get their hands on some of that money to improve their systems. And um, so, you know, what we're seeing is they're sort of feeling these multiple hammers sort of dropping on them. They have these uh, lead service line inventory requirements coming next year, like you mentioned. They have um, just a plethora of, of new regulations and, and things coming down the pipe that they feel is sort of being imposed on them, quote unquote. And these mandatory asset management plans that they 
they need to be um, they need to be certified at the time that they apply for these funds. So um, those are brand new the, for a lot of these folks. Uh, um, an organized and structured asset management plan is also new. So that's just one more um, one more item sort of being being put on their shoulders, so to speak. Um, but related specifically to to these lead service line inventories, um, I try to talk to them about this is this is the perfect entry point into asset management. You know, this is this is sort of a, a good way to orient to the process and what it looks like. Um, it's absolutely an asset management activity. It's an opportunity to to add a whole new asset type. You know, the customer side of the service line they've historically never they've had no real you know investigations into that piece. So. It's an opportunity to grow your asset management, you know, your data, um, and so that that's a little bit of what we're seeing. Just these competing priorities, and um, like we like we you mentioned in Switch City, we're trying to help them walk through that process slowly, and determine how to sort of wrap all these things into, you know, sort of wrap their minds around all of them at once. Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, impact of the the lead service line mandate. It's really had a tremendous impact on all, you, all water utilities and, uh, and, and probably more heavy on the smaller utilities than some of the larger ones. But I asked uh, Boston here with Goshen, they're right in kind of in the middle of it and kind of let's explain the impact of that. Because what, what happened with us when we were talking to Indi in, uh, Indiana Finance Authority and they were excited about the starting the uh, Water Asset Management Center and then the focus shifted is because of, of the uh, mandate. And I think what Adam mentioned and alluded to is it really all together, I kept on wondering, you know, why, why does the lead service line have to be separate from start, starting the center? Why can't we, you know, make that part of it? Because it is. I mean, you're going out and getting an inventory of your lead service lines and you're going to be exposed to so much more data that you can collect. What, how, do you ha how are you handling, handling that in uh, Goshen? So taking advantage of the funding opportunities is definitely something that we had to look into, um, kind of like how Adam said. Um, you know, having to have the certifications in place to get funding was necessary, and unfortunately during the first round, we weren't able to certify our asset management program yet. We just weren't there. Um, so we, we missed out on type three funding. We still have type one and type two. Uh, we went ahead and kind of similar to what you were saying, everything starts with core values. And looking at everything, we said, the amount of money that we're getting, it's not going to cover the entire city. So we went ahead and we hired summer interns and we're going door to door, just knocking on the door. Hey, can we come inside and take a look at, you know, the water coming in through your basement, you know? And we've also been working on a meter changeout program. So we developed a GIS program for our uh, utility crews that are going out and doing the meter swap out so that they can collect inventory while we're out there. Uh, we have about 11,000 customers right now. We have about 3,000 of the customer side that we've been able to identify so far. And I mean, at this point, by October of 2024, we're still wondering if we're going to be able to get that other 8,000, but um, hopefully we'll, I think we're in a place now where we're able to get type three funding. So we're going to try with uh, some potholing here in the in the springtime when it comes yeah. around, and hopefully by that point we'll we'll also get some more clarification on what we can do with some predictive analysis to maybe you know not do every house on the block, but maybe just a couple of houses on the block and say okay they're all the same material. Yeah. This project was done at the same time. We can just count these all as stuff that needs replaced. So yeah. But sometimes I think. You know, we, we we wonder why. Why don't more utilities jump on board here and, and see the, you know, see the potential? But a lot of it has to do with just the things that's mandated, things that's coming down, the, the permits and uh, programs that they have to comply with, and they're all really strapped and trying to do the things that they've been doing, but now they've got things added on to them. So I think that's part of it, too, and we have to be, I think, sensitive to that. But... Uh, I'm anxious to hear from you. We're opening up the uh, think tank part uh, and talk about what's on your mind. As you get prepared, I'd like to say that uh, when we did this first program here this time, we weren't real sure whether we would 
continue on next year or the year after with uh, with a Congress. But uh, we had a very positive uh, board meeting on on uh, when was it Wednesday? Well, thir uh, Thursday, Thursday afternoon, and it was very positive. And feedback that I've gotten here is very positive. So we're definitely going to do another Congress next year. It's probably going to be the second week in October. So you can go ahead and mark that. I'll get the, we'll get the dates specifically tied down soon. It's going to be in Indianapolis, and we're going to have a uh, facility there. Purdue University is starting a brand new campus in Indianapolis. They've always they've had for many years the joint venture with Indiana University, but that's been uh, separated, and so uh, they're starting. They're getting a new campus, and so we're looking at being utilizing that. Uh, being part of that too, but that's where a lot of th that's where you know we have the law that's been passed there, and we, we're looking at really getting having a uh, very good program there. So you'll be hearing more about that. So uh, before we do the think tank.